Good morning. I made all this. <laughs> Identity is like a window that frames our view of the world. Me con who? Who am I? That was the question I asked my mother on a hot Christmas day in Karachi, Pakistan. Am I Christian or Muslim? Am I American or Pakistani? Am I white or brown? And she looked at me and said, you are the best of both worlds. You can be whoever you want to be. And all of a sudden, my window frame became so wide, I almost fell out. So you mean I can just be me? At the age of five, it seems so simple just to be me. But it turns out it's more complicated. When I arrived in America at 17, I was asked again and again to check that one single identity box. The white box, the Asian box, the other box. I didn't fit into any of these boxes on the page. And all of a sudden, my gigantic window collapsed into a tiny, single box. And then I realized it wasn't about fitting in into a box. It was about defining my own path forward. My art and my story today is about seeing the world from multiple viewpoints. It's about painting a vision for our cities and homes and about reclaiming our lost and forgotten stories. <sighs> our stories are not one-dimensional. They're like a patchwork of maps. From war-torn cities to backyard gardens, they form the lattice window of our lives. I was born in Columbus, Ohio. And at the age of one, I moved to Karachi, Pakistan with my parents. My father was born in India before it was separated by the partition, and he fled to Pakistan in 1947. My mother is a Christian and American, and she's lived in Pakistan for the last 40 years. And now I've come full circle, and I'm married to an Indian man from Bombay, and my kids are studying Japanese in Portland. <laughs> And yes, we love and fight in five different languages. <laughs> when my daughter was born in the U.S., I was struck again by the harsh reality of how we define ourselves by the color of our skin. She had more Indian blood. She was browner than me. She had dark hair and dark eyebrows, and she stood out against her classmates. And I realized that I had to talk to her about how she was different, how she was brown and beautiful, and how she was deeply connected to all these other communities. And this experience of being able to navigate through different racial and cultural identities is a powerful experience that I want to share with you today. This path between cultures has many obstacles. From a very young age, I had to reconcile conflicting viewpoints, my American side, my Pakistani side, my Indian side, and they're often battling one another. But we are more similar than different. We have so many shared values. Our homes, our neighborhoods, our schools, the languages we speak, the places we worship, and yet we tend to segregate, exclude, and profile. We set up checkpoints, borders, and walls around each other and ourselves. What identity box do you check? What walls have you created to keep yourself safe? Places are like people. They can never be defined by one story. Growing up, what is Karachi really like? What is Pakistan really like? It's not that different from here. In fact, we had the most popular pizza hut in the whole of Asia. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Growing up, Karachi was called the city of lights, the Paris of Asia, because at night it glows like an iridescent gem on the Arabian Sea. And in the warm winter nights, these ancient and dangerous turtles climb onto the beaches and lay their eggs in giant sand spits. Karachi can be a place of amazing possibility, where my American mother founded a school that today has graduated 40,000 students in the last 30 years. Yes. Ooh. But the only story that we hear, and the story that has hijacked Pakistan, is one of terrorism, death, and religious fanaticism. I was in my studio, looking for maps of Karachi to paint, when all of a sudden a digital war game map popped up onto my screen. It was called Karachi, and when I clicked on it, I could go to places that my family frequented, and you could virtually bomb and destroy place after place in my hometown. I took those maps. And I took my paints and brushes, and I transformed them back into the magical places of my childhood, a place with endless sea and sky, with pink lotus flowers and banyan trees with roots so long you can swing on them like a monkey. We all need to find a vision for our places and our homes, without which there can be no change. And Karachi needs to find its way back to being the Paris of Asia, the city of lights. Sabine Mahmood, a human rights activist, did just that. She took a piece of war-torn Karachi and she transformed it into a community safe house where people could come and gather and talk about deeply contested issues. People from all over come and dream up big dreams and plan the next protest here. We, on January 16th, all over the world, united millions of Pakistanis organizing and protesting against terrorism. We are painting a new vision for ourselves, and we need to be heard and seen. My family and friends go out every day and do the hard work of making Karachi a better place. They are on the front lines of this battle. Fighting to reclaim our home, and wherever you are in this world, we too can find our own ways to reclaim our homes and make them a safer and more peaceful place. But how do we create a safer and peaceful future if we don't really acknowledge our past? My art is about. Not suppressing those stories and recording these stories that have been violently interrupted. The story of partition is one that you have not heard about in your school books. My grandfather and my father lived through this time. 1947 marked the end of the British Empire and the birth of a new India and a Pakistan. The country was to be divided along religious lines. And one British man carved up the Indian land in four weeks. He drew lines straight through states, cities, and even people's backyards. And in one year, that summer, 15 million people became homeless. During the transfer of power, there was utter chaos. People didn't know which country they belonged to. They had to flee at a moment's notice. Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs, once neighbors living peacefully together, now at each other's throats, and they lost a part of their humanity. My grandfather left behind his wife and six children to arrange for housing in Karachi. My grandmother was to follow a week later by train when all hell broke loose. He frantically. Went and telegrammed my grandmother, and it said, "Don't take the trains. Stop. They're coming into the station, full of dead bodies. Stop." My grandmother received that telegram just in time. 
But for many, it was too late, and a million people lost their lives that summer. How do we move forward when wounds run so deep? Is there a path forward? Seventy years later, it's still very hard for Indians and Pakistanis to travel across the border. The line of partition runs through many families, and shockingly, no memorial exists for all those lost lives. But recently, an Indian American woman started the Partition Archive. She began by recording partition witnesses. Some people were telling their story for the very first time, and then there was a call for citizen historians, and everyone signed up, including me. Every moment counts. When I lost my grandmother, a part of her story was lost as well. And before it's too late, I need to record my father's story. These stories are like windows into our past, and I need to share this knowledge with my children. And I ask you to do the same. Together, we are recording one story and preserving history by doing so. And this will become a source of learning for generations to come. But what kind of future are we really building? And is it really going to help recreate the city of lights? A hundred years ago, in World War I, we sent our first biplane into battle, and now we have unmanned predator drones, controlled by the U.S. military, by satellites 8,000 miles away. In Pakistan alone, 3,000 civilians have lost their lives. And drone strikes in eight other countries are still ongoing. Children in a schoolyard, a wedding party—these are all civilians on the wrong end of a drone strike. And last year, a Pakistani boy, a 13-year-old, came to the U.S. Congress to tell his story about how his mother. How his grandmother was gardening in her backyard when there was a drone strike and she was killed. He said, "I no longer love blue skies. I prefer gray skies because the drones don't fly when the skies are gray." In our summers here in Oregon, our skies are deep blue, and quietly. Under the radar, unknown to most, the Columbia River Gorge is quietly becoming the epicenter for military drone production. The drones that we're making in our backyard are flying over the backyards of people in Pakistan. All our fears and faraway unknowns box us in, and yet we are all interconnected. Our survival is tied to the survival of everybody else. Go out and ask that neighbor to come over that you've never met. Volunteer at a school that really needs your help. Set up a community space where people can dream big and plan the next protests. And travel to a country that you've never seen before. Each year, when I travel to Karachi. I look out of that window with my children, and the view from the above in the airplane is so beautiful and full of life and vitality. And yet, I know that we can die anywhere, in any place, at any time. Life is fragile, and yes, there's risk in going to Pakistan, but there's risk in staying away. And today. It is a new day, full of promise and hope, and I know this because I'm married to an Indian man, and tensions run high between his country and mine. And sometimes I joke that the line of partition runs straight through our bed. 
Our love story is like an Indian Romeo and Juliet, a dance Bollywood style. Two steps forward and one step back. We can all find our path forward by breaking out of our boxes, by painting and reclaiming our cities and recording the lost stories in our communities. Because when we look out of our window of identity, wherever we are in this world, we are all breathing the same air and we are all under the same blue sky. <laughs>